Okay, can you, can you hear me okay through this? Yeah? Okay, good, thanks. Thank you very much for the kind invitation and the chance to be here in uh, St. John's. Uh, it's, uh, I've been here maybe 15 times or so over the years, but it's always nice to get back. I really enjoy, enjoy visiting it, uh, and, uh, and I hope it lets me get away from it tomorrow, uh, that the weather cooperates. Um, I got to begin by congratulating uh, Brad Gushu and his rink and bringing the briar back to St. Uh, Newfoundland and Labrador. In pretty good style too, if I do say so. He curled like 100% for I think for every game that I watched. Um, so pretty impressive. So congratulations uh, to the Far East. Um, this is a standing friendly presentation. So I'm going to stand through most of the presentation, I hope, and uh, you're welcome to join me if you want. Apparently, sitting too much is bad for you, so if you want to get up, sit down. If you want to get up at the very end while you're clapping, that'd be really cool. Uh, so <laughs> um, I suppose in the context of this, too, you could have a nap, but I'd prefer you didn't do that. Um, but yeah, I'm here to talk about the Canadian movement guidelines, 24-hour uh, movement guidelines for the early years. That's age 0 to 4. I'm going to talk a little bit about the other age groups as we go through as well. The actual guidelines are in front of you, and there's more copies if for whatever reason you want them. I put, uh, put one out at each desk because I really don't want to carry all these around with me as I go from city to city. Um, so help yourself to them. Okay, how do I just arrow down and I'll do this? Okay. So this is what I'm hoping to achieve over the next 40 minutes or so, and if I start spending more than a minute on a slide, you know I'm babbling and this is going to go longer than planned, so hopefully that isn't going to happen. A little bit of background and rationale, what the methods are for developing guidelines by the look of the age of people here. Many of you are students, and so I want to develop an appreciation for what's involved with developing clinical practice or public health guidelines. It's not for the, the light of heart. The actual guidelines that we'll spend a bit of time on, uh, some of the surveillance and monitoring recommendations, dissemination, implementation, and activation, and evaluation of future research that needs to be done. So that's uh, Dave's homework. Uh, so start as background and rationale because most, uh, and I, I've been a kinesiology or equivalent prof for my whole career, and we don't work in this age group very much, the zero to four year olds, and, and so it, it's kind of strange, and I'm doing, some of you may know the Canadian Society for Exercise Physiology, that's the group that actually owns these guidelines, and I've done uh, some of their professional development days, and um, you know, most of the people that come to those are personal trainers, most people don't have two year old clients and so on. So, so it's a little bit weird. But this is a really, really important age group uh, in terms of setting kids off on healthy trajectories. So we know this is a critical period. Um, we also know a little bit about these behaviors in these different age groups. And I give some stats here that, you know, roughly three quarters of Canadian preschoolers are meeting the existing physical activity guidelines. Almost all toddlers are. Yet a very small proportion are meeting the screen time guidelines in those age groups. And believe it or not, we have no evidence-based sleep guidelines for the early years. There are guidelines there, but they're expert consensus statements. They haven't followed clinical practice guideline development processes. So we know that physical activity is good for health. We know that sedentary time is probably bad, but certainly related to health. And we know that sleep is related to health. So we've got this sort of triad there. But we also know intuitively that sleep has got to be related to how good our physical activity is for our health. So for example, if, you know, if, if you're an insomniac and you get up and you drag yourself through your workout or your run or something like that, in all likelihood the benefit to your blood pressure or cholesterol level or mental health or bone health or whatever it is you're measuring is probably not going to be as good as if you had high quality sleep the night before. Right? And, and you can imagine those relationships and in both directions. You know, the quality of sleep, and I'm, I'm going to hand out some report cards later on. Our Canadian kids, Too Tired to Move, was the cover of the participation report card in 2016. You know, so if you don't move enough to be tired to sleep, then you've got poor quality sleep and so on. And all the various relationships in here, we know they interact, they attenuate, they mitigate one another. So let me just give a quick example. So we know that physical activity, and this is the age group we're dealing with here, is good. So there's a big check mark there, whatever the indicator you might be. It could be pro-social health, it could, it could be uh, bone health, it could be any one of a number of indicators. But if that activity is occurring concurrently with a whole bunch of screen time, then 
the check mark gets a little bit smaller. You're sort of, you've got a negative added on to the positive, and so you're not getting as good an effect. And our previous physical activity guidelines and our focus on exercise only has not appreciated that. And so this movement continuum that is illustrated here, you know, the full 24 hours fits at some point along there. And you can imagine, even with you in the group, that what your uh, area under the curve might look like across here would differ. Some of you get a lot of high intensity activity, some none at all, but quite a bit of light intensity. Some are sedentary all the time. So there's various compositions across there. And in the past, the way that people like David and I would, would do research is we'd look at the far end, the far right of the continuum, and, and you know, manipulate that somewhat, do 10 more minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity or something, and then we'd look at some health effect. And either completely disregard everything else in the continuum or try and control for it. The problem that when you control for it is that it's actually codependent with everything else on it, and so you, you can't really control for it. So what we've learned over time is that the whole day matters, the same way that your whole diet matters. And there's different ways to achieve good health outcomes, the same way there's different ways through, through different food groups to get all the micro and macronutrients you need for a healthy diet. There's not just one way to go, and, and, and we know that. Physical activity is the same thing. Um, we just haven't studied it very much. We've studied very much the, uh, the one end of the continuum. And so with that background, we began this process of developing 24-hour movement guidelines. So understanding the whole day, beginning with sleep and then going throughout the day. We followed um, the, the procedural framework that I published with Bill Haskell in, in uh, this book. It's a 15-stage process. You'll see it sort of emerge in a, in a flow chart as we go along. And the full details, enough to put anyone to sleep, are available in the manuscript that are highlighted there. Um, uh, so everything that you wanted to know but was afraid to ask. So we're going to see this flow chart a, a little bit for the next 12 or 15 slides. Uh, it walks you through this recipe of guideline development that is accepted as the best practice um, around the world. And it begins with establishing a leadership team. So in this case, uh, and for the last 12 years, has been led by me. Uh, Valerie Carson, a, a relatively new professor at University of Alberta, was brought on as a co-PI as perhaps my successor somewhere down the, the line. Um, and the leadership committee is made up of the principal investigators, the funders, the research leads, and methodological consultants. So you see November 2015 is when we started this process in a formal way. Of course, it started a bit before that because I had to get money in place before that. The partners were the Canadian Society for Exercise Physiology who own the guidelines, the CHEO HALO group, which is the group that I lead, the University uh, of Alberta, which is where Val is, they provided resources for this, participation, same thing, and the Public Health Agency of Canada. So these are the official national guidelines. Okay, so then also in early November, we, er, in November, we, um, we got methodologists on board for the project, and then the guideline development panel needed to be established. This is the larger group that's actually going to help craft the guidelines. That's made up of the leadership committee, stakeholder groups, knowledge users, international collaborators, methodological consultants, target users. In this case, we had a mom and a daughter uh, that had no background on any of this sitting in and giving their feedback, and the project managers. The methodological consultants were there almost like auditors are at tax time uh, to make sure that everything that we were doing was documented, that it was free from bias, or if it wasn't free from bias, that was documented. And they were guided by two particular processes. One is the Agree To instrument. Agree stands for the Appraisal of Guidelines for Research Evaluation. It's an international standard for guideline development. It's got a whole series of checklists that they use to, to score us. I'll talk about that a little bit more. And the other is the grade process, the grading of recommendations, assessment, development, and evaluation. This assesses the quality of the evidence that underlies the guidelines. And I'll talk about that briefly. Uh, in a moment as well. Then, so now we're February of the next year, we had the first guideline development panel meeting. This was a three-day meeting of the people that I, that I listed there, um, about 32 people, I think, um, at the meeting. 
And the objectives of this first meeting was to outline the guideline development process and responsibilities. Most people are not involved in this world. I happen to be, but even the experts that you bring in have never done this. They're not quite sure how it's done. They've got an idea of what they think the guidelines should be and so on, but they haven't been through the process. We introduced the methodological consultants and explained their responsibilities because they kind of trump everything uh, if we start going astray. We heard from international delegates uh, seeking opportunities for harmonization around the world, learning from what they've done or what they were going to do. We had to finalize the process of evidence gathering in the PICOs. The PICOs are, those are the parameters of the systematic reviews that you do, population intervention, comparators, outcomes, and study designs. Uh, we established the timelines and began the discussions around knowledge translation, dissemination, and evaluation. And so um, if I go back here, then you see for March to December in the flow chart there, so for nine months, then, then the real grunt work begins. Um, and so we did four systematic reviews and one original compositional analysis. I'm going to go through these fairly quickly. They're all published. They're long, thick articles, which reflects the work that needs to go into us. So the four systematic reviews looked at, and they're, they're in bullet points there, the relationship between physical activity and holistic health outcomes in the early years, relationship between sedentary behavior and holistic health outcomes in the early years, relationship between sleep and holistic health outcomes in the early years, and then the relationship between various combinations of those three things above and the and relationship with health outcomes. And compositional analyses I'll explain in a moment. The holistic health outcomes I'm talking about are listed here, so we don't just look at one thing. So we're interested in the health of these little kids. And they don't have endpoints. They don't have myocardial infarctions. They don't have diabetes. They don't have osteoporosis and so on. So you've got to look for indicators, kind of upstream indicators of health. So we look at things like adiposity, motor development, fitness, cardiometabolic health, growth uh, trajectories, things like that. You can read down the list yourself. But quite a few of them. And the relationships that you find aren't always the same. And so we need to blend all that together because we're not developing guidelines for growth for the early years or for bone health or for psychosocial health. We're doing it for all of it together. So you can imagine art and science at some point in this meet. The systematic reviews were done and we sort of categorized within this fairly small age range into three other categories. Infants that are less than one, toddlers that are one to two, and preschoolers that are three and four. So three separate age groups within this age group. Uh, the methods are there. I won't go into this in too much detail. We gathered all English and French articles and we used GRADE to, to guide us through the, uh, uh, the search strategies. The searches were developed by research uh, librarians and, and peer-reviewed by another research librarian. In the end, are there any grad students in the audience? Some? Yeah, so we, we went through 35,000 articles. Um, so that's fun. Um, and by we, not me, my grad students. <laughs> um, and 271 papers ended up being included in the systematic reviews. One meta-analysis was able to be performed and narrative syntheses were conducted for most of the reviews. I can comment further on these if, if we want in the q and I won't, I won't explain too much of the research. But I'll have one slide for each of the systematic reviews, which are each about uh, 60 to 100 research journal pages long. So for physical activity, 96 studies were in this, approximately 70,000 participants from 36 countries. A range of the quality of evidence, this is the grade process here, you know, so the terminology that they use is very low, low, uh, moderate, and high. Those are the four categories of quality of evidence. So you're going to see these words, they won't mean too, too much to you. And the key findings, distilling all of this down a lot, specific types of physical activity, total physical activity and physical activity of at least moderate to vigorous physical intensity were favorably associated with multiple health indicators with evidence in general that more is better. Okay. For infants, 30 minutes of tummy time per day while awake appears to be beneficial for motor development. So these are two of kind of the higher order findings and you'll see them in the guidelines. The full systematic review is published uh, there. The citation is there. And this is in the presentation, which hopefully will be made available to people if you're interested in, in getting these papers. And by the way, they're all in open access. So if some of you are not part of the university, you can access these papers without having to jump through the hoops or pay for papers. For the sedent, yes. 
Tum yeah, so tummy time for infants. Anyone got little babies? Yeah, what's tummy time? <laughs> so this is when, when babies are awake, but on, on their tummy. And so this is the way they strengthen their shoulders, their neck, and, and so on. We're in the back to sleep phase of, I have four kids that all slept on their tummies because back then that's where they were supposed to sleep. They all sleep on their back now. Parents tend to default uh, to the back even you know, when their kids are not asleep. Um, and so that doesn't develop the shoulders, the neck muscles. It can flatten the head and they end up with plagiocephaly, flat head, um, and torticollis, which is a, a neck distortion. You must deal with these a little bit. Um, so anyways, so this is the exercise position for, for at least at a certain age where this is pretty much what they can do. And then they strengthen their neck and they, they uh, go down. And so several times a day they should do that. In general, uh, I work at a children's hospital uh, with some of the PTs and, and this is a problem, an increasing problem. Torticollis, plagiocephaly, uh, motor delays are associated with a lack of tummy time. You find that? Yeah, yeah. Um, you're welcome to do tummy time here too. It's a little bit like watching football, you know, on the living room floor. Uh, in the sedentary behavior, by chance, there were also 96 studies. These are not the same 96 studies. You can tell by the number of participants, almost 200,000 uh, from 33 countries. Again, a wide range of quality of evidence. What it shows in general is that the objectively measured sedentary time is generally not related to most health outcomes. We found this several times. So if you're using um, accelerometers, for example, to measure sedentary time. It tends not to be related to many health outcomes. Screen time or self-reported sedentary time does seem to be related. That's the second point there. Time in car seats or strollers and in the supine position, um, so on the back, were associated with unfavorable adiposity and motor development. And on the flip side, reading and storytelling associated uh, authentically with, with a care provider was associated with better cognitive development or in some cases no relationship. We were looking for positive parts of sedentary time. We're not trying to demonize sedentary time, especially in childhood, it's really important. Kids are really busy growing. That, that's kind of the main job that's going on. Um, they don't need to be active all the time, but there are different qualities of sedentary behavior and, and that systematic review, of course, is published as well. The sleep one had 69 studies, 150,000 participants from 23 countries. As with all of these, you'll see very wide range of quality of evidence. But probably the strongest for this systematic review. Um, short sleep duration is bad. Quality of that evidence is pretty good uh, across all ages, actually. Uh, it's associated with higher adiposity, poorer emotional regulation, impaired growth, more screen time, higher risk of injuries. There's an unclear association with cognitive uh, development, motor development, physical activity, and quality of life or well-being. Not nearly as much research in that area. But in the other ones, even with strong design, randomized controlled trials, you pretty consistently see short sleep times bad. Long sleep times not, um, not necessarily bad. Like it's not, it's not completely a U-shaped type of thing that you can sleep too much as well. Uh, but it's also very rare that that's the situation. And that's published uh, there. And the final one is the combination of behaviors. So a very small body of literature. So here's a great research opportunity. 10 studies, 7,500 kids, five countries. So these are ones that intervened on, well, in this case, physical activity and sedentary behavior or sleep duration and sedentary behavior. We had none that actually intervened on all three. So that is a great thesis uh, to be done. And generally speaking, what you find is the ideal combinations are good. If you have low sedentary behavior, high physical activity, or good sleep and low sedentary behavior, the, the outcome that you're looking at is better than its counterpart, where you have the bad ones. This is probably intuitive to people. And that was published by Corey. The compositional analysis, so a completely different way of looking at things, which hadn't, hasn't been done much in health research, has been done in economics, has been done in geology, but it's not analysis that's been done much in health. Um, and it allows us to look across the continuum with appropriate analysis. I said earlier that you know, we'll often look at the, the far right of the continuum and we might control for sleep time or sedentary time. But when you do that in a standard regression, it suggests, it, it, in fact, there's an assumption that 
those are independent of the variable that you're looking at. And they are not independent. In fact, they are completely codependent. So if I tell you to increase your physical activity by an hour a day, might be good advice, but it's only partially complete advice, right? Because at the expense of what? Go to bed an hour later so you have an hour less sleep? Or watch an hour less TV? You probably have in your mind that one of those might produce better health outcomes than the other, right? So without, and that's the way it is. We've got 20, you've got 1,440 minutes to play with. If you're going to do a little bit more of this, that's fine. It's got to come from somewhere. Where's it going to come from? And where it comes from influences what the result's going to be. So this is in finite space. That's what compositional analysis allows you to do. It allows you to assess a proportion relative to another proportion rather than taking an absolute number like we typically do uh, where, where it's in different geometric space. Okay? You see that? So, you, so you're in a confined space. You can only move the bubble within that space in different directions. Compositional analysis allows us to do that. Um, and we were the first ones to publish this, uh, this uh, in, in the world using these types of analyses on a 24-hour day. But you can imagine other scenarios in health where we should be using these analyses. So the objectives of this was to explore the combined associations of the composition of these various behaviors with, in this case, adiposity. That's the only data that we had on a national representative sample of three and four-year-olds. It's hard to get these sorts of data. But still, we had 552 kids. These are coming from the Canadian Health Measures Survey from Stats Canada. And this is what a day, a typical day looks like. If you look at the pie chart on your right-hand side, about half the day is spent sleeping, which isn't surprising. Uh, these are three and four-year-olds. Nearly a third in sedentary behavior, 15, 16% in light physical activity, and very little in energetic play, or the equivalent in adulthood, which is MVPA. Okay? The findings were that the composition of the movement behavior, so the relative proportions, were significantly related to BMI Z scores. So the composition matters. The whole day matters. It's not just one thing that's driving it. It's the relative proportionalities. Now, because the sample size was small, we were not able to... So you can do uh, what's called isotemporal substitution compositional analysis. So you can manipulate statistically that, okay, what if we took 30 minutes of MVPA and put it into sleep? Or what if we took 30 minutes of sedentary time and put it into sleep and these sorts of things? What would it do to the health outcome? And we did not find any significant relationships there. However, we've done these analyses with school-age kids and we found positive relationships for almost all the variables that we had. And we had many more than just adiposity. And they're all related to um, composition of the day and heavily driven by the energetic play or the moderate to vigorous physical activity. That paper is also published. So some additional considerations from GRADE. So um, in addition to the direct, so, so th GRADE is challenging us to make a decision for or against a recommendation and also to provide a strength of the recommendation. Okay, so that, that we, we believe this, we believe it really strongly or conditionally or something like that. In order to get to that, we use these various bullet points of information. We use the quality of the evidence, which I could dissect, but that would be a long, boring lecture. Uh, the balance of the benefits and harms. So you might be more inclined to make a strong recommendation if, you know, there's, there's some evidence of benefits, but there's no chance of harm. So even if the benefit isn't there, there, there's no harm. So you might be more inclined to say, yeah, go for it. Now, if there was kind of 50-50 that might be good, might be bad, then you'd, you, you know, you'd be a little more cautious. So that comes into play. End user preferences and values, the feasibility, acceptability, equity of it. Is it going to discriminate against low SES people or, or gender or something like that? These things come into play. Not quite as related to this as it might be to, to other guidelines. And then the resource implications and costs. So you can imagine uh, vaccination type of programs. And if we had a really expensive vaccine that worked really well for whatever, um, it's just it was completely not affordable, then your recommendation might be different, right? Because you, you can't implement it. So again, not, not relevant here, but these are all things that come into play. So continuing on our, our flow chart there, uh, we have guideline development panel two. After all the grunt work's done, those 35,000 articles reviewed and so on, and all the information 
synthesized and, and put into some sort of coherent fashion, we bring the group back and say, OK, this is what we found. And we ask the group to help us interpret it. We discuss the information. It's messy, as you can imagine. These are 271 papers, all with different measures, some different ages, some different sample sizes, different study designs, and so on. So really, really you know, a fruit salad of information that you've got to try and interpret. We reviewed the results of the cost effectiveness and resource use analysis. Then we, we actually wordsmith. We craft the guidelines as a group and say, OK, what can we say? And now, of course, we can anchor back. We have had physical activity guidelines in the past, so at least for physical activity. We can start with those and say, have we found information that disagrees with these? If not, then it's pretty easy. We can just continue on and so forth. Uh, then we created, after we'd done each individual component, we created them into a 24-hour guideline paradigm. We identified research gaps, which is part of the process, and we planned the launch, dissemination, promotion, and evaluation activities. So much more precise coming through. Then we go into a stakeholder consultation. So we've got draft guidelines, and we want to go out to you, the big you, all over the place and say, what do you think? Do you agree with these? Do you understand these? Any comments on them? And so we went out with a stakeholder survey that was sent out through our various networks. Some of you may have commented on this. Uh, we asked you to send it out further through your network, so a snowball type of thing. Uh, I've got some results later on, so I'll, I'll explain those. We also held 14 focus groups across the country in both languages with different groups, so some with pediatricians, some with early childhood educators, some with parents. Uh, and key informant interviews with certain groups as well. This was done from February to April. We're now in 2017. The results of all of those consultations are also published. The stakeholder survey was cross-sectional in English and French. Uh, again, I think I, I basically said everything that's on here. It went out for uh, three weeks or so in March to April a year ago. The focus groups and key informant interviews. Um, so key informant interviews were targeted to specific people or, or uh, organizations that we wanted their feedback on. The focus groups, which we had 14 of with 92 different participants, um, we asked people similar to the stakeholder survey, but we also asked them things like, uh, do you think this is achievable? Um, who would you like to get this advice from? So who's the intermediary that we should be using? Should it be an early childhood educator? Should it be the pediatrician? Should we go directly to parents? Should it be on the participation website? You know, things like that. And we followed all the, the best practices in terms of doing those and audio recording and uh, thematic analysis and so on. So then we had that information from each of those sources of feedback from stakeholder groups. Um, and so a subgroup of us from the guideline development panel got together with all of that information. And it's a lot of information, like 90 pages worth of, of uh, comments from the stakeholders. We had 695. I don't know if I've had that on the slide yet. 695 people responded to that survey. Um, and so we had to find themes of, of the comments and so on. So anyways, we went back and, and we revised the guidelines the best we could, staying true to the underlying science. So if people said, oh, I don't think it should be this long, I think you know, physical activity should be this long, uh, we didn't change things like that because ours was anchored to the systematic review evidence. That's what we had to stay with. But many of them would talk about the type of language or the ordering of things and so on. So it, it certainly did help to polish things. Um, so once they were revised, we then would go back to the full guideline development panel. We got consensus on the final guidelines. Then they're locked, translated, back translated. So we have the French versions as well. Um, and the four independent agree to auditors are able then to do their work because we've got a final product and they can assess everything from tip to tail in terms of how we did. I'll show those results in a minute. Everything, all the gory details of all of that, why we changed this word to that is in a guideline development report, which um, none of you will read, so that's OK. Uh, <laughs> uh, so just as a bit of a summary there, just so you have an appreciation for what goes into this, if you're going to criticize the guidelines, think about this first. We had greater th than um, 50 leadership committee meetings across the two years of developing these. We had two face-to-face -face guideline development panel meetings. This is 30 to 35 people, six days each. 
online, there's the 695, the, the online surveys. We had lots of people commenting on this from all the sectors we wanted, the physical activity, fitness, public health, healthcare, education, research, childcare sectors. Uh, parents' um, agreement was very, very high, in almost all cases above 95% with uh, agreement. Um, they thought that the guidelines were feasible, acceptable, useful, better than segregated guidelines. So the fact that you brought these together was thank you very much. Instead of having sleep guidelines that are kind of disconnected and they're not making any connection certainly with physical activity. And so, uh, so they thought that was really good. Strong endorsement came from the key informant interviews and the focus groups as well. And consequently, all of our recommendations, all that's in the sheet in front of you, are strong recommendations. There are no conditional, there are no weak recommendations. Having said that, the evidence upon which they are based, in many cases, is weak. But there's almost inconceivable harm by having a child have a better night's sleep. You know? um, so, so this helped to drive some of the decisions. The four independent agree reviewers, which I, I didn't even know, uh, all rated us between 89 and 100% on each of the domains. So that's very, very high. And so we have four systematic reviews. We've got the compositional analyses. We've got expert consensus. We've got stakeholder feedback. We've got methodological advice. And that's our foundation of evidence that, that leads to the, the guidelines that are in front of you. Um, and so then we do the knowledge translation stuff. So you've got the science done. You've got everything sort of nailed down. You've got it in English and French. You've kind of got this endorsement by the greater stakeholder community so that you know when you do launch, there's not going to be this immediate backlash out there against you. But then you still have the knowledge translation stuff. And so we worked on development of a visual identity, which I'll show you in a minute. It's on your thing too. Uh, and the various tools and, and supports uh, that are available, I'll outline. Um, and we launched on November 20th, just this past year. So this is the iconography associated with the 24-hour guidelines in Canada. This is the one, not for the early years, it won't look like what you have, but this is the one for children and youth. We did the children and youth, and, and by that's the 5 to 17-year-olds, so these are school-aged kids. We released those in June of 2016. Okay, and this was the iconography for it, and that started what we hope will be a family of icons that will look similar, and certainly you can see the similarity with the one that's in front of you. And, and the discussion around this when we were developing this is that it represents the four speeds of childhood. Sweat, step, sleep, sit. And the alliteration's done on purpose to try and make it easier for people to understand. It's supposed to look like a number four. I know some people look at it and they don't see a four, but it's supposed to be a four for the four speeds of childhood. Uh, some people say, what do you, you mean the bar graph? And I'm, yeah, okay, the bar graph, but it's a four. Uh, and it's designed deliberately, so you'll see where the, it, it's in very crude proportionality to what you should have. So you need some of the MVPA, the sweat, all right? Sloping up, so more is better. More step, which is the light physical activity, the incidental stuff that we do throughout the day. Again, sloping up, more is better. Sleep, you want more, but not too much. You know, it's kind of this idea, you, do, you don't want too much, too little, but there's a pretty good window in there. And it's, of course, the most dominant time. And then the sit, which really actually reflects screen time, is very small, and aiming down, less is better. So that's all buried in there. And so even if you don't know the details of the guidelines, the idea is over time, you will look at that image, and even if you can't see the sweat, step, sleep, sit, or anything, it's like, oh, that's my healthy day message. That reminds me I need a good night's sleep, I need to get some activity, I shouldn't sit too much. And if that's achieved, uh, we'd be really happy. If, if that became over time what that meant to people without the details there. So with the early years, of course, there's a bit more of a challenge. Infants don't sweat and step. They pee and poop, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, among other things. Um, so, so we had to combine those first categories into move. So we lose the alliteration and so on, but it also makes it distinctively different from the children and youth. Otherwise, the concepts are still there. And so this was, this was important to do, uh, so that we have this uh, visual identity, this iconography there. And so the guidelines are on each of the, the desks. 
And there are two-sided things. On one side is the preamble, which is necessary for guideline development. I know it's text heavy. It's also content heavy. But they're things that we have to say. You have to say them. You know, to whom does this apply? On what evidence is this based? What sort of benefits are accrued? Where's more information available? How does it relate to children with chronic disease? All these sorts of things. So we're criticized all the time, you know, that it, it's too hard to understand, and most people don't read it. But if you're a healthcare provider or something, you should know it because it gives you the information you need to know to whom it applies. And then on the other side are the guidelines. As succinct as they can be for four different behaviors for three different age groups. So it's really hard to kind of get it down any smaller than what we have there. And I won't spend uh, time going through this because I'm going to play a video at the end that's going to walk you through this and you've got it in front of you. But I've got a slide here for each of the age groups. So this one's for infants. All right. So they all start with Canadian 24-hour movement guidelines for the early years. For healthy growth and development, infants, toddlers, and preschoolers should achieve the recommended balance of physical activity, high-quality sedentary behavior, and sufficient sleep. A healthy 24-hour includes. And then it goes through the columns, which differ slightly by the age groups. And then on the bottom, uh, which I find to be the most important piece, because it's the give and take piece, it says replacing time restrained or sedentary screen time with additional energetic play and trading indoor for outdoor time while preserving sufficient sleep can provide greater health benefits. So as a parent, th these are the gives and takes. If you can do this, do a little bit more of that. You know, these are, these are the, the things you can trade off. And so the, the, the actual content in the middle, as I said, is in front of you. So I won't read through those now, and the little cartoon character at the end will do that for me. Now, in terms of dissemination, implementation, and activation, um, we had pro proactive national media relations for the release of the guidelines on November 20th. We had greater than 60 million media impressions. Media impressions are the number of media hits, so the number of stories that TV stations, newspapers that cover you, times the reach of that particular thing. So the, uh, you know, the Carbonier Gazette might reach 10,000 people, but the uh, Globe and Mail might reach 5 million people, okay? Um, the distribution of uh, guideline materials uh, was sent out through all of our partner networks, which is rather extensive in Canada. This is part of a cross-country lecture tour that's funded by the Public Health Agency of Canada to try and get the information out, to try and get more champions out there using this, continuing to pass it along. All kinds of promotional materials and campaign stuff that's available on the CSEP website. So www.csep.ca backslash guidelines. Uh, and that includes the tear sheets, everything in English and French. Webinars, canned webinars are there that are basically saying what I've said. It's actually me saying what I'm saying here, more or less. I'm just not here. Uh, glossary of terms, which are very inclusive and give examples for people that don't actually have the ability to step, but translate that to someone in a wheelchair, just as an example. Um, guideline development report is there, as I mentioned, that you don't want to read. Uh, the press release, the history of guidelines article that I wrote for the 50th anniversary of CSEP. Uh, the Build Your Best Day link, which I'll mention in the next slide again. Uh, we had a, a symposium at the CSEP annual general meeting or the conference, and that was taped and is in there. And, and scenarios for CSEP certified members are there. That if you have this situation, this is what you should do, and this is how it maps out onto the 24-hour guidelines. There's swag, water bottles, things like that. And additional stuff is being developed and will be released on March 31st at the www.buildyourbestday backslash early years website. Now this build your best day th and 13 research papers that I've been sort of uh, alluding to as I go through here. The build your best day website, www.buildyourbestday.com, was built for the children and youth guidelines and really built for kind of the 8 to 12 year old kids. And what it challenges you to do is go in and build your best day, and there's all kinds of real and, and, and sort of whimsical possibilities for you to build your best day. Each one's assumed to be an hour. And you pull it in, and you build your morning, and you build your afternoon, and you build your evening, and you build your night. And if you deviate from the guidelines, you get warnings. It's like, oh, but you've got too much screen time today, or you remember to get a good night's sleep, or you're not getting enough physical activity. And the idea is to try and train fairly young kids to be aware of these gives and takes, that it's all okay. 
you know, uh, and this, but a typical day should be a healthy day with a good night's sleep, not too much screen time, and this amount of physical activity. So it's, and then you can finish it and you can print it out as your best day and, and do these sorts of things. So, so we're not doing that for the early years, but we're using that same portal as an as a information spot for, um, for the various resources we've got. So what can you do? And I made some assumptions about who was going to be here, that they might be fitness professionals, public health professionals, early childhood educators, teachers, et cetera. Um, if you're none of these, you can probably see yourself in this somewhere. But you can help by reading the materials, even just what's in front of you there, um, and master the content, have an idea about what it is, why it is, why does a whole day matter. Disseminate the guidelines and paper copies, and please take the ones that are on the desks here. I don't want to carry them around. Um, you can post them on social media. You can, uh, you can disseminate them verbally. Link the guidelines on your website. Promote them through different uh, professional development opportunities you might be involved in. Um, support the implementation of the guidelines at your kid's daycare center or where you might be working, schools, other venues recreation centers where they have early childhood uh, support. Reduce sedentary time in general in programming activities, especially screen time if that's possible. Make sure children of all abilities are included. Try and link to other things, other major initiatives that are going on. Physical literacy is a big thing in Canada right now, so is there a way to kind of link and, and build off of other initiatives that are happening? Uh, Encourage the, the leaders to be active with their kids and be a role model, if you can be. Not too many people standing yet, I see, by the way. Um, we've got a bunch of evaluation activities um, uh, on the go. Uh, I'll go through these really quickly. But when we release the guidelines, we, we study uh, the media impact, and we also study the quality of the uptake of the guidelines. So RP, is the media on target? Or are they actually negative? And this was really interesting because I'll show in a few slides. Uh, Australia released their guidelines the day after us. They, they basically copied us. This was all orchestrated and so on. They got a lot of negative coverage around the screen time, uh, which we were expecting in Canada. You know, people are very defensive about the screen time because everyone has too much of it and you somehow need to justify that and say that it's good. It's not good. But, but people are defensive about it. And so we were prepared for hostile questions and so on like that. We didn't get any in Canada. None of the stories really went that way. But in Australia, they did. So it was really interesting just looking at the quality of the coverage in those two cases. We've done a baseline awareness survey before the guidelines went out. This was through a survey we do with participation. And the, um, the follow-up surveys are underway right now. We're doing a series of them. So we're going to see whether or not there's any awareness of these 24-hour guidelines. Um, we've done a survey already about stakeholders, about their beliefs. Do you like the integrated versus segregated approach? And it's, it's, it's universal. Everyone likes the fact that they're together. It makes sense to them. It helps, it helps them uh, on, a, on a large level to understand what a healthy day looks like. So as opposed to physical activity guidelines, screen time guidelines, sleep guidelines, light activity guidelines, they're all together like the food guides. We've got web analytics going on with the Build Your Best Day websites and so on. There's research on inclusiveness going on. In fact, it, it's done for, again, for children with different challenges that might not see themselves in there. You know, they can't step or they don't sweat or some of these things are just not realistic. And so we have a resource actually that, that's done now. It'll be launched very soon to, to kind of help interpret the guidelines for people with different movement or sensory challenges. We're examining the brand awareness of the whole four. Do people get it? Do they understand it? Do they have good feelings about it? And so on. Uh, quite a few master's theses uh, going on with the evaluation research. And there's a lot of research that needs to be done. We know, we know very little about this. The guidelines are really um, a house of cards. Uh, there's very little good quality research looking at dose-response relationships. So we've picked numbers out of the air. You're going to see 180 minutes of physical activity of any intensity down there. You know, the level of evidence supporting 180 minutes versus 150 versus 200 is really, really sketchy. We need to do those sort of titration studies. Few studies have used valid and reliable measures for sedentary behavior or sleep. 
You've got the accelerometers and active pals and different things for physical activity, but not so good of information for sedentary behavior and sleep, or controlling for other things like diet. Uh, for some things, we had no information at all. If you look at the systematic review articles, we had certain categories in there, and we captured zero articles. There's no information, so we don't have any idea whether it's good or bad. Um, and there's virtually no research looking at the whole day uh, and trying to manipulate those variables and, and using creative analyses, like I was saying, isos isotemporal substitution compositional analyses. It's just emerging in the field, so lots of opportunity. And I need to just put a plug in. So we've done the early years now. We've done the school age kids, so we got 0 to 17.99 done. We have just begun the process for adults and older adults. The same sort of thing will be, re and uh, we don't have funding in place for it, so I'm not sure on the timelines, but if it can go the way the others did, 18 months, 20 months from now, hopefully we would have the whole thing covered, kind of from, from birth through to 100 years, uh, all within the paradigm of the whole day matters, the 24-hour guidelines. So hopefully uh, we can announce that in the future. We make recommendations in some of the manuscripts about how to do surveillance and monitoring. We don't have surveillance of 24-hour periods in general across Canada, so we've made some recommendations about with what we have now, how could you assess the proportion of people meeting the 24-hour guidelines. And I, I won't go through these, um, so it'll take a little bit too long, but there's a measure of the physical activity for each of the age groups, there's a measure of screen time for each of the age groups, and there's a measure of sleep for each of the age groups. They're on the slide here, uh, and they're in the manuscript uh, that I've cited, the Trombley et al. manuscript. And we've done this already, but there might be other data sets for this to be done on. And so this is a Venn diagram showing preschoolers. These are three and four year olds, again, from the Canadian Health Measures Survey, a nationally representative sample. And so the way you look at this, in the middle there you see the 12.7. That's the proportion of people that are inside all three of the circles, so that are meeting all of the, physical, all of the guidelines recommended in the surveillance. So 12% of the kids are meeting the 24-hour movement guidelines for the early years. The 3.3 up in the top corner, that's the proportion meeting none of the guidelines. Okay? And then for each of the guidelines, you would look at the totality in the circle. So to save you doing the math, it's, it's around two-thirds meet the physical activity guideline, around 84% meet the sleep guideline, and around a quarter meet the screen time guideline, and all the other various combinations in there. That's also published in, uh, in a manuscript that's open access. And so that was for preschoolers. We don't have national data on toddlers, but we do have enough information from a study in, in Edmonton to get some information. So the equivalent numbers from the previous Venn diagram is the 12.1, when you see all three sort of towards the right of the screen. It was 12.7 for the preschoolers, very similar. 12% are meeting all three of the guidelines. And then the equivalent for each of the, the circles, the, the sort of in the middle, SP at least, is those that meet only the sleep guideline, 83%, about 15% meet the screen time guideline, and 100% meet the physical activity guideline. All of our toddlers are meeting the physical activity guideline of 180 minutes of any uh, intensity physical activity per day in that uh, manuscripts published as well. Okay, I'm almost at the end here, folks. Um, we recommend that these be updated on a 10-year cycle, or if strong, important information suggests that something we've currently got in there is incorrect and needs to be adjusted. One of the side effects of this that we did not anticipate going in is that we have influenced the world in a fairly major way. Um, and so New Zealand found out that we were doing this and they were about to update their physical activity guidelines, changed their whole strategy, went for the whole day, 24-hour guidelines, released them, um, uh, and so what you see here are their guidelines. So they've copied us for both early years and children and youth. I mentioned Australia. I had an Aussie uh, on one of the international people on our panel. Um, and so I actually went to Australia with him to make a pitch to their government to piggyback on our process. Our process cost about $1.2 million to make the children and youth guidelines, about 800000 to do the early years. Uh, only the difference in price was that we had the iconography and all that kind of background work in place. Um, so we went to them and said, listen, you can, you can copy these, basically. It's up-to-date literature, the guidelines, you know, and a few minor uh, cultural differences. 
And so anyways, they, they bought it. Uh, they, they gave uh, Tony Oakley in, in Wollongong some money to do theirs. We orchestrated it so that they would release after us, the day after us, which was actually only about seven hours after us because of the 15-hour time difference. Um, and so this was really cool and got the both governments working together, both excited, and was the first time in both countries that the health ministers actually participated in the release of the guidelines because they didn't want to be outdone by their counterpart. Uh, it was really cool kind of to see that, that sort of dynamic. And on even a higher level, the World Health Organization is now copying uh, exactly what we're doing and copying our, well, taking our advantage of our work. In the uh, Ending Childhood Obesity uh, Special Commission report, uh, it specifically asked for the WHO to provide member states with, with guidelines of these. And the process is underway. I'm a part of that panel. The last meeting actually is going to be hosted in Canada, in Ottawa, by me um, in uh, almost exactly a month. Uh, where those guidelines will be crafted, then they will go out for consultation and so on. So there will be global 24-hour movement guidelines for children and youth that will apply to all I think, 206 member states that can adapt them and so on. So, so this is really a movement that's happening across the world, uh, very much being led by Canada. So there's tons of materials available on this. I, I mentioned the 13 papers. These are just kind of a list, listing of them. There's the tear sheets that are available in English and French. You can print these off. You can order them from CSAP, the guideline development report, the webinars, the glossary, the digital platform on Build Your Best Day, which will be uh, launched on March 31st. And so just to, to summarize, the Canadian 24-hour movement guidelines for the early years, age 0 to 4, an integration of physical activity, sedentary behavior, and sleep, tell us that the whole day matters. And young children need to move, sleep, and sit the right amounts for optimal health. Not just move, or not just sleep, or not just sit, but it's the combination matters. The whole day matters. And this is not to tell people to micromanage. I think that's what my next slide here is, is to get you. You know that we've lost touch with the basics. You know, here's people watching a sunrise on TV when it's right out their window. And, and this, this, to me, is really reflective of the world that we live in. Um, and it's damaging our health, and it's rewiring our kids from the youngest of ages. And what we're after is just people to make a typical day, a typical day, the most common day, the habitual day, the healthy day that begins with a good night's sleep, gets lots of light intensity activity or play or tummy time, depending on the age, throughout the day. Some energetic play as well. Very little extended sedentary behavior. Okay. If you look in the guidelines, you know, it tells you no, no rest restrained time for more than an hour at a time, whether that's a high chair or a car chair or anything like this. And we really need to get back to the basics. And that's really what we're trying to tell people because a whole generation of young parents have lost that, mostly because of screens, the draw of the screen. Uh, and, and it's not that you have to be anti-screen or without screens, but you need to do it in balance. That's what the evidence suggests. Lots of people are involved in doing this. This is the list of the guideline development panel. I won't go through them. There are the partners, again, that anteed up the money to actually make it happen. These are the references that I cited throughout here. Uh, I know you can't see it, but they're there. And I put this in deliberately so that if you do want to see the presentation, I think Dave might have it, or you might be able to post it somewhere. Uh, and if you need to or want any of this information for your thesis or a report that you're writing, you can get it fairly easily. And I just want to close. So we've done a series of animated videos that uh, condense everything that I said here to like a couple minutes. There's one strictly for the infants, one strictly for the toddlers, one strictly for the preschoolers. They're at these websites. They're available free on the internet. So if this is something that you could use with a client or as a professional development opportunity, that's fine. I'm going to play the full one, which is, I think, three minutes long, which goes through the guidelines. It's going to kind of read the guidelines to you in kind of a... Uh, a fun way. Uh, one of these. Read that in here. Read that in here. I, yeah, there it is. I had it open. So hopefully. Children don't just grow every day. They are growing every hour of every day. And what they are That's doing growing. during these hours is important for their development. To provide guidance as to what makes up a healthy day, Canada has created new 24-hour movement guidelines for the early years that encourage a healthy balance between physical activity, sedentary behavior, and sleep. 
There are many benefits for infants, toddlers, and preschoolers when they have sufficient physical activity, high quality sedentary behavior, and sufficient sleep. Their brains are more active, which among other things leads to faster language development, increased self-confidence, and better mental health. Their bodies tend to be healthier, social skills such as cooperation improve, and they are better able to manage their emotions. These guidelines represent a new perspective on child development based on the best available evidence from experts in the field. For infants under one year old, a healthy 24 hours includes physical activity several times a day in a variety of ways, particularly through floor-based play. Infants that are not yet crawling should have at least 30 minutes of tummy time spread throughout the day. Not being restrained more than one hour at a time, such as in a stroller or high chair. Screen time is not recommended. When sedentary, an interactive activity like reading and storytelling with a caregiver is encouraged. Infants that are zero to three months old should get 14 to 17 hours of good quality sleep, including naps, while infants that are four to 11 months old should get 12 to 16 hours. For toddlers that are one to two years old, a healthy 24 hours includes at least 180 minutes of physical activity at any intensity spread throughout the day, including some energetic play and more is always better. Not being restrained more than one hour at a time, as well as not sitting for extended periods. For toddlers under two years, screen time is not recommended. For toddlers that are two years old, screen time should be no more than one hour. When sedentary, an interactive activity like reading and storytelling with a caregiver is encouraged. At this age, consistent bedtimes and wake-up times should be established that ensure the child is getting 11 to 14 hours of good quality sleep, including naps. For preschoolers that are three to four years old, a healthy 24 hours includes at least 180 minutes of physical activities spread throughout the day, of which at least 60 minutes should be energetic play. Not being restrained more than one hour at a time, as well as not sitting for extended periods, screen time should be limited to no more than one hour. When sedentary, an interactive activity like reading and storytelling with a caregiver is encouraged. At three to four years old, children should be getting 10 to 13 hours of quality sleep, which may include a nap with consistent bedtimes and wake up times. At any age, it is strongly recommended that screen time and restrain time be replaced with additional energetic play, preferably outdoors whenever possible. Child care providers are in a unique position to help promote the new movement guidelines. For example, by restricting screen time and encouraging active play during the day, but also in educating parents and carers about the guidelines. At times, it may seem challenging to stick to these guidelines, but given the proven benefits to a child's development, a progressive adjustment towards achieving them is recommended. By working in partnership, we can help our youngest generation build the best day possible. So there you go, those are the guidelines. Thank you for your attention. And I think, I don't know, we have time for questions. We're right at an hour now.